Coming up this morning on the morning medical update, meet a woman who went from hospice to hope after a devastating blood cancer prognosis. The medical team who gave her a second opinion and a second chance. Good morning. It is Friday, October 21st. I'm Jessica Lovell. Thank you so much for joining us. We are live here inside the Dulce Simons Jr. Family Broadcast Studio. We are dedicating our time this week to the power of a second opinion, why they matter, and the remarkable outcomes after receiving one. Make sure you get your questions sent in to us on YouTube, Facebook, and the Medical News Network. You can find links to those right there on your screen, or go ahead and put them in the chat below. We'll get to those in just a moment. In 2018, Margie Harper was diagnosed with myeloid dysplastic syndrome, also known as pre-leukemia. It essentially means the cells in her bone marrow were abnormal. When she went in for another biopsy in early 2019, she was diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia. It is a rare blood cancer. The American Cancer Society found that one in three patients with MDS can progress to acute myeloid leukemia. Margie started treatment at a hospital near her home in New Orleans. Doctors there told her that she was too high risk for a much needed stem cell transplant, but she didn't like that answer. So she went in search of a new one, a second opinion, and she found it here in Kansas City with her sister by her side. And they both join us this morning to talk about this remarkable journey together. Margie is at her home in Louisiana. Her sister, Tina Reynolds, is with us here in Kansas City. And with me here in studio is the magical Dr. Joseph McGurk, the Division Director of Hematologic Malignancies and Cellular Therapeutics at the University of Kansas Cancer Center. Good morning to you. Good morning, Jess. Good to see you. It's always great to bring you together with your patients. Absolutely. It's exciting. It's so good to see her with a long hair like that. I know it's been a while. <laughs> it's been a while. I, I was looking at your beautiful pictures and um, it certainly tells the story. Margie, how are you doing today? Tell us. Um, yeah, I'm doing great actually. I'm, everything's fine. Um, I'm just happy to be here, loving life and just got back from a big road trip to Wyoming for 30 days and uh, it's pretty exciting. So tell us, uh, just kind of sum up your, your initial diagnosis, Margie, for us, and what that was like when you heard the news. Um, well, the MDS, I, I, was, I was pretty concerned about. It took a long time to get any treatment for that, and by the time they did, I had the AML, which was pretty devastating. Um, I, 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 but I, would, you know, I just turn, kept turning to Tina, like, what should we do? It was never, what should I do? It was, what should we do? And um, it was, it's just the treatment I got at uh, Oshner's was, a, you know, it just wasn't, or at the hospital wasn't up to par for me and my sisters. So I don't know. It was, it was a devastating news, I think, for anybody to hear the word cancer. And I love how you said we, because I think anytime someone is diagnosed, and Dr. McGurk, you'll say the family support, the friends, the people yes. alongside with you make all the difference, right? All the difference in the world. And yes. Tina certainly made the difference because you urged your sister. You said, okay, uh, doctors in Louisiana said that you were not a good um, candidate to receive a transplant. We'll, we'll talk about why that was, but Tina, when you heard that, you said, all right, come back home. Let's go to the cancer center. Absolutely. Um, I've always had faith in the University of Kansas Cancer Center. Um, they treated my mother as well, uh, and I just knew that we couldn't give up without um, a second opinion, going to someone else and making sure that we didn't have any other options. And um, of course, our first meeting with Dr. McGurk um, brought back our hope, and we knew that we had a chance. And that hope, you're right, you said started like 30 years ago when your mother was diagnosed also with a really rare cancer. She was not given good news, not expected to live. She's alive and well today, correct? Yes, correct. After receiving her, her care here. So I understand why you wanted to get your sister back up here and, and um, right inside the office of Dr. McGurk. So um, Dr. McGurk, tell us about Margie's second opinion from you. What were you able to uncover uh, about some possible treatment options for her? Absolutely. It was critically important. The only possible hope for a cure of Mar Marjorie's uh, what we call secondary acute myelitis leukemia was represented by 
uh, an allogeneic stem cell transplant using somebody else as a stem cell donor. That was the only shot we were going to have. But before we could get there, we had to get her into complete remission. And she had had a rough course. She, she, uh, she, she can tell you about that, uh, where she had a serious life-threatening uh, intestinal infection when she was in Louisiana uh, and uh, uh, had to have a surgery to approach that, a big, very high-risk surgery. Uh, she came to us. She had the eye of the tiger. She was very determined. Uh, to live. Her sister was an incredible hero. you hear more about that. Um, but, uh, and so we, we embarked on an intensive chemotherapy regimen, very high risk. Unfortunately, it didn't work. We couldn't get this thing into uh, a complete remission. Uh, and so Marjorie had decided that she had had enough of this intensive chemotherapy that was making her very, very sick. All, she almost lost her life, as I mentioned, uh, her first go around, out of the second go around. Uh, she said, enough is enough here, uh, and she decided to make a different move. And uh, her sister came to her rescue. <laughs> Marjorie will tell you about her hospice uh, 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 journey, uh, but her sister uh, came to me and said, you know, Dr. McGurk, we heard that there's a new uh, uh, drug out there that's being developed that has the possible, uh, a possibility of putting her in remission, but it's only available for patients with a very specific, very rare genetic disorder in their leukemia. We looked, she had that genetic disorder. Uh, we uh, gave her this pill, not intensive chemotherapy, and she went into complete remission. So we were able to take her to a potentially life-saving uh, stem cell transplant, and the rest is right in front of you. So is, is Tina on staff now? She just works right alongside you and helps <laughs> bring, bring these options. How, how rare is that, though, to have somebody come and say, Dr. McGurk, I mean, I'm sorry, you know how I feel about you. I feel like you have the answers to everything, but to have to know that there's these advocates, the family advocates and the patient advocates coming to you and saying, hey, let's try this. It's profoundly meaningful. Uh, and I, I wish every family had someone like Tina. Tina was by her side throughout this entire journey. Uh, she did her homework. She searched and searched and looking for answers. Uh, and she was absolutely a lifesaver. And this is the first patient we ever treated with this, med this new brand new medication, and we're always at the state of the art at the leading edge, uh, but we quickly sought uh, uh, the genetic analysis to tell us, hey, that molecule, that, that genetic abnormality was there. Uh, we got that drug quickly and absolutely uh, stunning complete remission, which doesn't happen in the majority of patients who get this drug. It's only a small percentage. So not only did she have that rare genetic mutation, she was one of the small percentage of patients who would go into a complete remission with this drug. So we had uh, miracles lined up one after another. Hence the power of that second opinion that, that Tina uh, helped Marjorie get. And I wanna talk with both of you and kind of go back and forth between the two sisters. Um, and I know, <laughs> Tina, we were talking and you said you guys are very different, but you're very, very close. And, and so it, it makes, it, it's, I have a sister too, and I, I know what it's like. Um, they're, they're, they're your partner in life throughout your whole life. So um, it's so wonderful to see. But your sister, uh, Tina, she was going through this during COVID. And uh, what, a, what a scary time. She was living with you. You said you, she lived with you for 18 months. Kind of talk to us, both of you, about how that all worked out and, and how you protected her and, and just kind of what that part of the journey was like. Um, well, we were very careful. Uh, I work in a school, but we were on shut down at that time working from home. So I was able to be home with her every day. That was nice. I also had um, a sophomore in college and a senior in high school living at home. Um, because of COVID. Um, so we were all in our home together, but we were very safe. Um, the boys stayed in the basement. Um, Margie was upstairs. Um, but yeah, I mean, we had to take precautions. Um, the only place she went was to and from clinic. And um, we were fortunate. Um, both of my boys actually did um, have COVID at one time or another while they were living in the home with Margie, but we were very careful and um, Margie fortunately never um, got sick. So Margie, now that you're doing well, is there anything in your lifestyle that you've had to change um, to stay healthy and um, do things right? Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, I had so much downtime between COVID and treatment that I got a little lax in things um more active now at home and um doing things more 
Um, I do have some setbacks because I do have an ostomy bag from the surgery in uh, New Orleans. So that's kind of a hindrance, but I'm dealing with that. Um, it's, you know, my concentration's a problem still, muscle pains, but nothing I can't live with. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm dealing with it. It's, it's, that's, it's worth it, you know, anything. Tina, you were telling me yesterday when we were visiting about this hospice state. I mean, that is just a word that no family, patient, anyone wants to hear about. And when she was in this hospice state, you just uh, you you just said you just weren't so sure. You just weren't quite willing to accept that yeah. state of health for her. Tell us about that and what you were noticing. Well, when we brought her home from the hospital, she was um, not doing well. Um, certainly, I believed at that time that hospice, you know, was probably was what was what we needed. Um, but after having her home for about a week, she started to do so much better and she was eating and I could just see life coming back to her rather than leaving her. And so um, we contacted Dr. McGurk's team and I just said, I think she needs a blood transfusion because um, she really seems to be doing better. Um, that's the day that um, the team saw us, and um, that's the day we found out about that specific genetic mutation and the opportunity to try the new drug that was out and available. And um, so hospice didn't last very long in our house. <laughs> we went um, probably two weeks before we gave up on hospice and went back to treatment. <laughs> And how rare is that, Dr. McGurk? I mean, I think when people hear hospice, they go into a whole new, I have never been through that experience with a family member, but I think when you when you start talking about that, that has got to take people down a very grim path. Yes. I mean, and to take her, and now we're sitting here today, how rare is that? that extraordinarily rare for someone to have gone to hospice uh, and then come out of hospice uh, and receive a therapy, respond to that therapy in the way uh, that Marjorie did in going into complete remission uh, and then being able to get to a stem cell transplant. is This is an extraordinarily rare story. And, you know, even <laughs> when we found that genetic mutation, she had multiple other genetic mutations associated with her cancer. And there had not been reports of those types of patients in the studies, the early studies that were being done, of any of them having responses. So patients with just that one pure genetic mutation are the ones who would respond to the therapy. But we, we had nothing to lose whatsoever. We had Marjorie's life potentially uh, to lose if we didn't try something. So we threw the Hail Mary pass with them and with their support and permission. And, uh, and they caught it. You bet. They caught it. So why, though, would you want to take a chance on someone in maybe another place wouldn't? What, what, what about Marjorie in her case made you go, no? No, I want to. I want to try this. I think we've. We, I think we can do something here. Absolutely, we're one of the largest transplant programs in the United States, uh, and uh, so we, we we will perform about 400 stem cell transplants this year and cell therapies, CAR T cell therapy. We've talked about before, uh, and so there's a lot of experience, and we uh, uh, the cancers are all based on genetic abnormalities, and uh, we try to focus in on very specific patient-centered therapies that are tailored to their specific needs. And we know if we can just remit their disease, we can get them into complete remission. So we do uh, often push the envelope in our center, uh, and uh, we do often win those battles. We don't always win those battles, of course. We, we lose some patients. The, the program uh, that uh, Marjorie came to us from is a very small program mm -hmm. uh, and not a, not a uh, long history uh, program. And I think that uh, among them, with all uh, due respect to them, I, I think that they obviously cared about her. They wanted to try, but they felt that this, that, uh, this was going to be too high risk for their center to be able to undertake. Um, so they did what was right. For their center. Uh, yes, they did. They, they did what was right for their center. But uh, we, we all uh, need to uh, be very resourceful and uh, uh, go to the ends of the earth if necessary uh, to advocate for our patients and to avail them of potentially curative therapeutic options like that which Marjorie received. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so she self-referred um, uh, to our center and many patients uh, do, not just in our region but from around the nation. Uh, and, uh, and we turn over every stone. So let's talk about this second opinion though, because every time you're on, you talk about just these blood cancers are so specific and now the treatments are so specific. And so by the time somebody might be diagnosed with, 
with this. They're going through so much as it is. How would someone know the questions to ask? What 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 bells should be ringing in someone's head to think, I want to seek a second opinion? I think in Marjorie's case, it was, we can't treat you. Yeah. And, you know, Tina knowing and, and going through what they went through with their mother knew, let's let's keep searching for answers. But what might someone need to know and what questions should they ask if, if they're sitting there with a diagnosis and, and just don't like the answer they're hearing? Absolutely. Uh, well, acute uh, leukemias, uh, acute myelogenous leukemia, the most common in adults, acute level biological leukemia, most common in children, both happen in both populations, is always, without exception, a medical emergency. Mm -hmm. Those patients need to be taken care of. They need to be taken care of within hours and not days. Uh, we are mm -hmm. frequently out at the Colorado border putting a patient on a helicopter and getting them here when we get that diagnosis. The, this is not the type of uh, uh, diagnosis that should be taken care of in a community hospital, mm -hmm. period. We have compelling data in the medical literature that tell us that. These patients must be taken care of by a large leukemia program with uh, uh, great uh, experience. Uh, and so uh, in those uh, situations, if you are at a community hospital, people need to know acute leukemia belongs in a large leukemia program and a program that has a large stem cell transplant program where the, all the doctors, nurses, pharmacists, laboratory personnel are highly specialized in just this area, our infectious disease doctors like Dr. Hawkinson, highly specialized in taking care of such patients. Uh, that's not available in a community center, in a community hospital. Community hospitals take care of the majority of illnesses that occur uh, in patients. But uh, diagnoses like these, uh, acute le leukemias, very aggressive high-grade lymphomas, uh, very aggressive multiple myelomas where stem cell transplants is standard of care. There are a number of diagnoses where uh, you should absolutely be at an academic center, not just seeking a second opinion. But when you go to that, uh, that academic center, it's our job to educate patients about what questions they should be asking us. And we instruct them, we give, give them reading material, materials, and we ask them to keep a list of questions. So when I come in in the morning, I want you to have your questions written down so we can go through things. The more our patients understand about their disease, their disease processes, why we're doing what we're doing, what the alternatives are to that, the more compliant uh, uh, and understanding that they are, the better they're going to do, without exception. Ladies, before uh, before we get to Dr. Hawkinson, I want to show some photos because, uh, Tina, you were saying how close you, you two have been through for, through the years. And I, I was looking at the pictures of, um, I mean, look at that. Hello. I think me and my sister have a picture some, somewhat similar. And yes, the 80s prom dresses, you've got to have them. But I think I said, oh my gosh, she looks so beautiful. And this was when her hair, she had no hair and she was sitting in the, in the chair, Tina, and I said, oh my gosh, Marjorie is so pretty. She's so pretty. And you go, oh my gosh, you should have seen her with that gorgeous long hair. And so Dr. McGurk, you said this morning, it's so nice to see her back with her hair. But Marjorie, what, what advice do you have for people as they're going through this and just mm -hmm. trying to keep their, their head up and their spirit up and, and, to, fight, and to fight back against this? Yeah, um, I think the first day was the most devastating day, and the only time I really cried about it. Um, after that, I just went along with the treatment. But in my case, we didn't ask enough questions when I went from my local oncologist to uh, New Orleans. We didn't ask enough questions. I would re completely redo that answer. Um, I I would just more questions. They would never give us an answer to my genetic mutations. Um, they refused, said we didn't need to know. And the minute a doctor tells you you don't need to know something because it's above your head, you need to get a better explanation or have somebody explain it to you or seek that second opinion immediately. And in my case, I didn't get treatment for 10 months after my MDS diagnosis. Now with Dr. McGurk, and once I saw him, everything went so fast and was taken care of very quickly, very fast. Everything was so efficient there at the University of Kansas. Um, the team was wonderful. Dr. McGurk is the best. Um, and then having Tina um, taking care of me. I, I mean, everything just fell into place. I mean, we're just so blessed. And the reason we wanted to have both of you on, on the show together is because this is the picture of what it looks like. Dr. Merkirk, you have a family member that's kind of with you and needs to ask questions. And it's nice to have that person along along the ride, the medical ride with you, you know, to sit there and yes. listen to what you're telling them. It's a lot. It can feel like it's over your head, right? Oh, absolutely. But, you know, if we take our time mm -hmm. and uh, and we do our job well, 
uh, patients should understand what their disease is all about, what the uh, natural history of it is, what the chances of they're responding to therapy. They need to understand what those genetic abnormalities are and what they mean uh, to the patient's course. They need to know the risks, benefits, the alternatives that you're uh, teaching them because, again, that helps them and their family understand better. It helped Tina to do the research that she mm -hmm. needed uh, to do. She, uh, uh, she's my hero, uh, as uh, is Marjorie, for putting up with us uh, uh, throughout this extremely trying time. And let me tell you one thing I do want to say about Tina. I tell patients, uh, family members, you're a coach, and you guys can play cards together and watch movies together, but she has to get out of bed, she has to walk, she has to eat, and if she's not irritated, if Marjorie's not irritated with you, Tina, you're not doing your job well, and uh, Marjorie was pretty irritated with her. Okay, is that, is that true? all true, right, Tina? Absolutely. Um, she didn't want to eat. She didn't want to walk. She um, fought me a little bit, but um, I usually won. <laughs> perfect. I love a little sibling, a little sibling back and forth. It, it's perfect. Perfect. Okay, let's get to Dr. Dana Hawkinson real quick, Medical Director of Infection Prevention and Control with our COVID count on this Friday as we head into the weekend and yeah. COVID headlines. Good morning yeah. to you. Hi. It's Hi. always good to work with Dr. McGurk. Isn't it? His team, you don't want to be here for that, but uh, they are the best team to work with for sure if you have that problem. Uh, so right now here in the hospital, 17 active infections, two in the ICU, two on the ventilator, still 18 in that recovery period. Numbers are holding steady, which is good. Um, hopefully we will continue to see overall national cases decrease as well. So. Okay, so the FDA approved the Novavax mm -hmm. monovalent COVID-19 booster. What options does this give people looking for the booster? Yeah, I mean, I think this is great. This is one more option. You know, there are people who were hesitant to take the, the primary series and then the additional doses. Um, this continues uh, to be more things that we can use and you can use so that individually you can protect your health to help decrease your chance of hospitalization and those other complications as well. We know that Novavax is being used around the world uh, quite a bit more than here in the United States uh, primarily. It sounds like there is a lot of booster use for Novavax. Uh, it is very safe. It is with those kind of old vaccine platform that we've used for other vaccines as well. I think it's just one more thing we can use. Um, again, we know that the mRNA vaccines are safe and effective. Uh, this is one more safe and effective vaccine that we can use that you can use to help provide yourself protection. Okay, so on that note, research shows that globally, yeah. Uh, an uptake of COVID vaccines for kids has been a little spotty. So some mm -hmm. health, health experts are saying that maybe this is, they were launched during a time when COVID was not really considered as much of a crisis. So what's yeah. your take on that? Uh, I mean, I think there's a lot of missteps here. I think the missteps came from initially saying children aren't affected when they're infected, and that's not true. And we know children can have uh, severe outcomes, although uh, at the proportions less than adults and, and older children, but we know they can. More importantly, we know they can also suffer from long COVID as well. I think there just continues to be uh, that misinformation and that hesitancy uh, from those adults spilling over into those children because, uh, you know, we know that children can have those problems with infection. We know that the vaccines can help prevent those issues as well. Um, hopefully there will be increased uptake. Um, we are thankful that children do seem to be uh, less affected uh, in compared to adults and older people, but they can still have those uh, severe outcomes as well. So, you know, vaccine uptake among adults, but also children uh, is lower than we would like. We just want everybody to be healthy and, and not have to succumb to those problems to come to the hospital for it. And of course, you know, long COVID, which is going to be with us for quite some time. Let's see if we have any reporters on the line today. We do not. We do have some community questions though. First one's from Janet and it's to you, Dr. Hawkinson. She heard on the nightly news that all the kids that are being hospitalized with viruses are because they didn't get exposed to a lot of viruses due to the pandemic. They were kind of, you know, kept kept away from all of that. Do you, how much of that do you think? You know, I, I think it? there is, we have seen that, you know, initially, I think a year and a half ago, we, we knew that there was a delay in the typical RSV season in Australia. We have very good evidence and reporting on that. We have heard about what we call this immune debt because we were using masking. There was some social distancing. There was a decrease in the amount 
uh, of respiratory viruses that were going around and that were transferring from person to person. So there is some of that as well. Uh, so I think it is very important to understand that those initial uh, uh, waves that we would see, you know, throughout 2020 and 2021 were probably delayed. And so we maybe are seeing a little bit more of that uh, going on right now. Certainly we know that is true for RSV, uh, but also some of those other respiratory viral infections as well. Uh, we knew that was true for influenza the last couple of years. Hopefully the rates won't be too high, but we are expecting increased rates uh, and transmission of, those, uh, of that virus as well. Dr. McGurk, Lindsay wants to know, should all people receive second opinions when it comes to all cancers or just certain ones for certain reasons? Well, first, uh, uh, first of all, I, I, I don't uh, think there's uh, ever a downside to getting a second opinion. Uh, and, if, uh, uh, and if a healthcare provider pushes back against that, then uh, all the more reason you should get a second opinion. Um, but in particular, it's critically important for patients with uh, a, a life-threatening illness uh, for which there are highly effective therapies, potentially curative therapies, everything is at stake, uh, like in Marjorie's case with acute leukemia. Uh, absolutely essential. There are so many things that our community providers and community hospitals can take care of and do very well at. But, uh, but when you're facing a, a life and death circumstance, a second opinion uh, has no downside. And also patients self-educating. And, uh, and being careful about what they look at online, looking at reputable sources such as Leukemia Lymphoma Society, some of our own websites that explain what acute leukemia is all about, and other blood cancers and, and cancers in general. The, more, uh, the, 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 uh, the better our patients are educated, uh, the better they'll do in the long term. So like in Marjorie's case, what exactly, uh, John wants to know, does a stem cell transplant do and why are they risky for some people? Many of these blood cancers, such as acute leukemia, are cancers of the stem cells themselves and the bone marrow. The bone marrow is a complex organ, generates all of our blood elements, red blood cells that carry oxygen, platelets that help us stop bleeding, and the white blood cells, of which there are many different types, that make up our immune system allow us to fight infection. When the stem cells or some of their daughter cells become cancerous, that uh, it manifests as myelin asbestos syndrome or acute leukemia, myelin fibrosis, a whole broad array of blood cancers. And so we have to get rid of the organ. We have to destroy the entire organ, the bone marrow, mm -hmm. and then we replace it with someone else's bone marrow and trick that bone marrow into thinking it actually belongs in our uh, patient so it won't attack our patient and cause a problem called graft resistance disease. Uh, it's a complex process, uh, but highly effective and curative and uh, tens of thousands of patients in this nation on a yearly basis. So on that, Scott asks, is a stem cell transplant essentially a cure? Uh, for many patients, it is a cure. Okay. Well, I want to get to our final thoughts today. Such a great conversation and such a great way to wrap up our Power of a Second Opinion Week. So we appreciate our sisters for being here. And Tina, I'm going to start with you. Just your final thoughts uh, for our viewers and listeners. Um, I think when it's a family member um, and they're not able to um, this to look for their own answers. Um, you have to become their advocate and do your research. Um, there's so much out there. Just don't give up. Um, you know, it would have been easy to say, okay, this is it and accept that. But um, just do your research, believe, hope, um, find that doctor that also gives you hope because um, I think when we were in New Orleans, I was losing hope. Um, and then as soon as we met with Dr. McKirk, it, it just brought it all back that we're fighting again. We're ready to go. And um, That's so, I yeah, I, I, I think knowledge is power and um, just ask your questions and do your research and um, be the coach. <laughs> And with everything that Dr. McGurk has taught you today, he's, his advice is you can bug your sister. You, and if you're not annoying her to the fullest extent, you're not doing your job. I think that's your great Absolutely. advice of the day. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Tina, for being, again, such a great health advocate and a great example of how the, the part that family members play in getting our patients well. Marjorie, your final thoughts today. Uh, I would just like to um, thank my sister, obviously, uh, as usual, and Dr. McGurk uh, for taking my case. Um, 
you know, and I just wanted to let him know that I still have those jeans with all the big holes in them. And I love him. <laughs> and uh, as much as he teased me about my clothes, the first day of meeting him was a happy day, um, even though things were a little crazy at the time. But um, just the opportunity he gave me and uh, to help us get through this line and, and to treat me and to, to really help me and give me hope. It was, that was the best day. It, it was a great day. Just the University of Kansas itself and Dr. McGurk are, are awesome, number one. I would recommend them to anybody, anybody from anywhere in the country. I love it. Thank you so much for that. Now, of course, you have to, and we're glad you're doing well, Margie. What's the thing with the Thank pants, you. the holes? What happened? What was the story? I uh, teased uh, uh, Marjorie <laughs> because she came in with blue jeans with holes in them. That's the end thing, Dr. McGurk. I, heard, I understood that, <laughs> but I advised uh, <laughs> Tina that uh, she, her, Marjorie's Christmas present should be uh, a pair of slacks without holes in them. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Dr. McGurk is really great everything. Fashion? I don't know. Although you're rocking a good bow tie today. So, all right. I love it. I love that. Um, okay. So, uh, Dr. McGurk, I want final thoughts from you. What would you like us to know? Be resourceful. Seek a second opinion. Don't be shy about that. Self-educate uh, and uh, stay laser focused on beating these uh, terrible blood cancers because we have highly effective therapies. Uh, and for many of our patients, they, they are potentially curative therapies. Uh, so uh, uh, stay the course, and we're always here to, uh, to uh, provide the very best care. And pull people over that finish line. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for always being here with yeah, us. Appreciate it. Dr. Hopkins, and final thoughts today. Yeah, thanks to our guests, and always thanks to, to Dr. McGurk and his team as well. I uh, just want everybody to try and have a good weekend. Uh, you know, Enjoy outdoors if you can, uh, be with your friends and family, and be safe. And thank you all so much today for being with us. You can catch our updates anytime by logging onto Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Go out, of course, make it a great weekend, and we'll see you back here Monday at 8 o'clock. Coming up Monday on the Morning Medical Update, there's new hope for the 30% of breast cancer patients who suffer from lymphedema. I'm Jessica Lovell. The surgeons from the University of Kansas Cancer Center have a new option for this chronic, long-term condition. Join us to learn more Monday at 8. Subscribe to our Morning Medical Update and Open Mics with Dr. Stide's podcast. Now, everywhere podcasts are available.